The possibility of life on other planets. Now on BBC One, Patrick Moore explores the sky at night. Good evening. In this programme, we're going to go hunting for life on other worlds. And there's one highly relevant news note. The Odyssey spacecraft has been launched toward Mars and will get there next October. And Mars, remember, is a fascinating place. In our last programme, we showed you pictures sent back from Mars Global Surveyor. And it now seems that there may have been liquid water there rather later than those we expected. There, Newton Crater, are those gullies cut by liquid water? And there could well be liquid water not far below the dusty surface. And Odyssey may well tell us. And if so, well, if there's water, what about life? Is there any life on Mars? Well, to talk about life on Mars and life in general, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Monica Grady of the Natural History Museum. Welcome to the sky at night, Monica. Hello. First of all, let's just think about the essential ingredients for life. Well, the things that we actually need are ingredients like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen, four of the most abundant elements in the cosmos. We also need phosphorus and sulfur. Carbon, uh, uh, life on Earth is based on carbon, mainly because the properties of the carbon atom are so special. Carbon can join itself into chains which can loop around into rings and carbon has a very, very complex chemistry. That's the basis of life on the Earth, and we assume that because of its properties, carbon is also the basis of life beyond the Earth. That's certainly very reasonable. We know about these chemicals, but um, where did these chemicals come from? Well, ultimately, all the chemicals came from the Big Bang. 15,000 million years ago. That's right, yes, when the whole, the whole caboodle was formed in a, in a massive great explosion. Uh, and uh, not long after the, the explosion, in uh, a few hundred thousand years, atoms formed, hydrogen and helium formed, stars got built, galaxies, clusters of stars were made. Uh, and within these stars, the different elements were formed as well. And these elements are processed through stars and through the interstellar medium. Elements are returned to the interstellar medium through explosions. So, for instance, when a large star explodes, it might form a supernova, um, such as we see uh, in the remnant of the, the Crab Nebula. Another way which stars um, send material back is when a red giant throws off a planetary nebula, like this Cat's Eye Nebula here. So this is all material going back, which builds up more stars, which builds up planets, which eventually builds life. Well, thanks to these exploding stars, we know about the elements, but after all, for life, something else is needed. Yes, you can't just have the elements. You need to bring the elements together to, to build up molecules. And for this, you need a transport mechanism, so you need a solvent. The best solvent that we know of is water, liquid water. Lots of things, different types of things, dissolve in water. Water is stable over a large range of temperature. There are other solvents, for instance, liquid ammonia, but water is stable over a much, much greater range of temperatures. So to look for life, we're in effect looking for liquid water. We know that the planets began by having some of these chemical building blocks, but um, where did the rest come from? Well, as you say, most of the planets started off with their own um, small amount, or their own amounts of the building blocks, but there are objects like asteroids and comets, the remnants of which we see like in this little object here, this meteorite, these c also contain the building blocks. Which is, that, is, that, is that the Murchison? This is a fragment of the Murchison meteorite, which fell in Australia in 1969. It's very dark, mm -hmm. and um, it's dark because it's rich in carbon, and it contains things like carboxylic acids, amino acids, the simple molecules which um, were joined together to form these building blocks of life. So I'm not talking about bacteria coming yeah. from meteorites, but I'm talking about the building blocks coming not just to the Earth, yeah. but to other planets. Well, water gives us a suitable solvent, but there's still something missing. That, of course, is energy. Yes, that's right. It's no good bringing the ingredients of a cake together without actually giving them the energy to bake them into the cake. 
it's the same with the requirement for life on the earth. Um, most life uses the sun's energy, so plants photosynthesize and plants are the basis of the food chain. And that's where most of, of life gains its energy. And we've found now that sun's energy can be used in a variety of places that we hadn't even really thought about in the past. So for instance, in Antarctica, in the dry valleys, where it's very, very cold and it's dry and inhospitable, there is still a huge number of microorganisms which survive actually within the rocks of Antarctica, um, using the sun's energy and drawing their nutrients from the rocks themselves. We can also find life in various other parts of the earth, things that don't draw their energy from the sun. So for instance, on the ocean floors, uh, there are the black smokers, the hydrothermal vents where superheated water comes out and there's a whole ecosystem based on the chemical energy of that heat and the reactions that are going on. On the earth's surface, uh, in hot places, hot springs and geysers, there are reactions which are going on where sulfur-loving bacteria can survive in the heat and in the acid. So we're seeing on the Earth a whole range of habitats that we hadn't previously dreamt of, had existed where microorganisms can survive in the hot and in the cold and in the acid and in the dark. But for surface life, we do have to have a reasonable temperature range where water can be stable and other things being equal. I think that's important. Therefore, the sun is surrounded by a fairly narrow ecosphere or habitable zone inside which the temperature is right for life to exist. And there it is, by AU with one astronomical unit, the Earth's sun distance, or 93 million miles. And there we see uh, Venus is just inside the habitable zone, Mars just outside, and Earth slap in the middle. That's right. It's been described as the Goldilocks hypothesis. Venus is too hot. Mars is too cold, whereas the Earth, like the baby bear's porridge, is just the right temperature. While they are looking for liquid water, and it's stable on the Earth's surface, that surface, there are other mechanisms which might keep water stable. And so we must look beyond the Earth, at different places within the solar system, where liquid water might be stable. Let's come back to Mars for a moment, can we, since Mars is so much in the news. These global surveyor pictures seem to indicate that they are may have been liquid water there rather more recently than we expected. I mean, yesterday on the cosmic trail. Yes, yes, as recently as a million years ago, which, as you say, is, is, is uh, very, very recent indeed. Mars is a very interesting planet, very similar to the Earth in many, many ways. It, it's rocky, although its diameter is only about half the size of, of the Earth. And it also, like the Earth, has its, uh, its ingredients for life there. The Viking probes of 1976 oh, yes. searched for life on Mars, and, yes. and they didn't find any. They just scratched the surface soil to look to sniff for life. Didn't find anything. Very ambiguous results. We know, or we understand now, that Mars, um, the, the surface of Mars is likely to be sterile, because Mars has only a very, very thin atmosphere now. However, in the past, when Mars's atmosphere was thicker, when water was stable at the surface, it's possible that life could have been present. Well, what is the evidence? I'm thinking now, of course, of the meteorites said to have come from Mars, all 16 of them. Mm -hmm. And they're said to have come from Mars. And I wonder, though, how can you be so sure that these 16 meteorites do come from Mars and not from the asteroid belt, where almost all the others do come from? Well, I've got a small chip of a, a Martian meteorite down here. Which is that, which is this, that one? This is a meteorite called Narkla, which fell in Egypt yeah. in 1911. And it's got contained within it the evidence which shows that it's, it's come from Mars. First of all, what sets it apart from other meteorites like Murchison, which came from the asteroid belt, what sets it apart is its age. Meteorites from the asteroid belt have an age of about 4,560 million years, the age of the solar system. The uh, meteorites from Mars are much, much younger, and this indicates that they have come from a planet which still had molten activity, still had volcanoes on it, way beyond the formation of the solar system. And this could only be a planet, it couldn't be a satellite. What actually tells you that this planet is Mars is that buried within these, uh, these rocks are tiny little uh, fragments of glass, black glass. 
and these were formed when something came down and hit the surface of Mars and made a, and made a crater on the surface and threw bits off the, the, the surface. In that instant of the shock, some of the minerals were melted and turned to glass. And while they were molten, they sucked in the atmosphere that was around them and then quenched. Now you can dig the bits of glass out with a needle and melt them and get the gas that's out. Um, you, you can analyze that gas. And it has the same composition as Mars's atmosphere, as measured by the Viking probe. So just like a stick of rock might say Blackpool all the way through it, this has got something in it which says Mars all the way through it, which is indisputable. Well, yes, certainly. Also, of course, there's been a great deal of talk that some of these Martian meteorites might contain evidence of past Martian life. Well, Monica, you've analysed these things. What do you think about it, Martian or not? Well, difficult to say. There is definitely organic molecules, organic compounds in these rocks, and some of those organics come from Mars. There's no doubt about that. Organic simply means it's got carbon in it. It doesn't mean biological. Okay. There has been work carried out on one particular Martian meteorite called Allen Hills 84001. This was a meteorite found in Antarctica um, and found to be Martian. And it's, when you look closely at its surface, you can see these very orange patches on the surface. These patches, which are about a millimetre across, are carbonate grains, the same stuff that limestone is made from on the Earth. They were formed in warm, salty water on the surface of Mars, the sort of place where microorganisms might live. When you look at a much higher resolution at those um, patches, some American scientists found structures like this one here, this, this thing they described as a fossilized bacterium. It's only 200 nanometers, 0.2 of a micron long, smaller than most terrestrial bacteria. And they described it as a fossilized Martian bacterium. But the evidence for this is very, very um, controversial and not agreed to by many scientists. So the jury are here. The jury is still out. The jury is still out. I suppose we will find out for certain. Maybe send up automatic probes, land on Mars, and bring back samples. Mm -hmm. That should be possible in the next few years, I think. Mm -hmm. But now, let's go further, shall we? Let's go beyond Mars, beyond the asteroid belt, what about the chances of life anywhere in the really chilly regions of the solar system? Well, once you've gone out beyond Mars and the asteroid belt, the next thing you bump into is Jupiter, a gas giant. And um, Jupiter, of course, is made mainly of hydrogen and helium. Very uh, dynamic and turbulent planet, rotates very fast. There are many lightning bolts within its atmosphere, and also it's very, very... Um, a high radiation, so very dangerous sort of place, very, very unlikely that any life is living on Jupiter. Yes, indeed. But Jupiter is at the centre of its own little satellite system, and the four largest satellites, uh, the Galilean satellites of Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, all show interesting characteristics which might indicate that life could be present on those satellites. I suppose um, Europa is the prime candidate. Yes, Europa has been uh, thought for quite some time to be the most interesting of the satellites. It's the smallest of the four satellites. It's uh, just a bit smaller than our own moon. The image that we're seeing here is two pictures of Europa, one on the left in natural colour. The second on the right has been enhanced, so you can see the different types of ice, the blue ice, the white ice. And the orange-brown material is dust, which is contained within ice. Results from the Galileo probe have shown that Europa, as a planet, has a, an iron-rich core over which is a silicate, a rocky mantle and then there's a thin crust, but between the ice crust and the silicate mantle is a layer, maybe 100, 200 metres deep, of an ocean, probably of slushy water. Now, to keep that water liquid and not solid ice, there must be a heat source, and that heat source is Jupiter. Jupiter pulls and pushes on Europa as Europa goes round the planet, and this heating keeps the ice surface molten. There must be some way, though, of the heat getting from the centre of Europa into the ocean. And it's possible that on Europa's ocean floor, 
are hydrothermal vents, black smokers, just like we have on the Earth's ocean floors. And if they're there, it's possible that there might be an ecosystem there as well. Speculation, but... A weird, sunless sea. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are three other Galileans, Ganymede, Callisto, and fascinating Io. Fascinating Io, indeed. Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Uh, it's got a very interesting face, <laughs> which has uh, been described as looking a bit like a pizza, it with the, the, the orange and the, the yellow and the red. All these colours are from the sulphur, which is so liberally distributed across its surface. Io's structure um, is it's also has a molten interior, heated again by Jupiter's heating. And there's a, a silicate interior, which has abundant sulphur in it. Now, the the surface temperature range of Io is very, very wide, from about minus 150 degrees C to plus 300 degrees C. So you've got this vast range in temperature. So somewhere between minus 150 and plus 300 is 25 degrees C, which is good for life. Mm. We know from geysers and hot springs on the Earth that there are bacteria which do like very sulfur-rich places. They like hot, acid, sulfur there might be something similar on Io. Mm, I don't like the sound of Io somehow. What about the outer moons, Ganymede and Callisto? Ganymede and Callisto, again, very interesting, showing different characteristics. Ganymede is the largest satellite in the solar system and is also, like Io and Europa, heated by Jupiter's tidal energy. It's partially molten inside. Again, it has an icy crust and probably an icy mantle. And then there might be some possibility of, of some zone where life is present. But what is more tantalizing is Callisto. Callisto is just that bit smaller than Ganymede, but sufficiently far away from Jupiter that it's not been heated by Jupiter's heating. This image on the left again shows Callisto, and on the right is a color enhanced image to show differences in surface structures. The Galileo probe, though, when it went past um, Callisto, showed that it had some strange magnetic anomalies which might be consistent with having some type of slushy layer there. Because Callisto has never been heated fully, it's still a mixture of rock and ice on the inside. So it's possible if there is a slushy layer there, again, there might be a subsurface ocean. Very, <laughs> very tantalizing. Further out still, there's the lovely ringed world of Saturn. And at the present moment, a probe, Cassini-Huygens, is on its way there, will arrive in the year 2004. And Saturn does have one interesting satellite, Titan, with a dense natural atmosphere, and that may give us clues as to how life is formed. That's right. When we look at Titan, we don't know much about it. It's very um, thickly obscured by clouds. The Huygens probe, though, will descend through those clouds and look at what we believe is the rough, rocky surface of Titan, looking at lakes, possibly of ethane, methane, and other hydrocarbons, not to look for life, but to look at the, the chemistry of life, which might be... Um, going on there, the sort of life, the sort of reactions that were going on on the primordial Earth, so trying to understand how life got going. Well, there's certainly plenty of choice in the solar system, but I think one thing we've been certain about, there's no intelligent life in the solar system, except possibly on the Earth, and I'm not sure about that, but is there any life at all in Europa, Ganymede, Callisto? Time will tell. Monica, thank you very much. Thank you. Don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical news, our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash sky at night or CFAX page 620. And meanwhile, do look at the night sky. Mars is coming into view and there's plenty to see. So watch this space. Good night.